So uh, fast forward a few more days, uh, all, all these operations are still ongoing, the different courses of action. But uh, Monday the 2nd, some Australian federal divers show up. Uh, like I said, now Rick and John are, are successfully diving deeper into the cave every day and laying line as they go. The drilling had begun in some areas, but it hadn't gotten very deep yet. And teams had found other entrances, but l like I said earlier, there wasn't any fruition to, the, to them actually leading to the main chamber. But by this point, you, as you can imagine, we're starting to like count the days that these kids have been in here. And we're like, there's no way that, you know, it, it, we didn't say no way, but we were like, all right, now it's been, you know, almost seven days. They haven't had any, you know, food. Who knows what the water situation is like. And we were really starting to lean towards like uh, a possible body recovery, you know. And uh, then at about t uh, 10 o'clock at night, Rick and John make the discovery and find them about uh, 2.4 kilometers in. As you can see, the, uh, the entrance of the cave on that diagram is the upper right as you come in. And then that you hit the T junction, you make a left, and then you go all the way down to where that kind of that star is, and that's where they found them on a ledge. And, uh, and, and this was one of the first things that, that you see. They uh, had a GoPro. Yeah, question here. They didn't speak very good English, so they were trying to co communicate through through one of the children. They were they were trying to find out how long they had been in there, and they were asking for for food. They were rubbing their stomachs. Monday, Monday. Okay, but one week. And Monday, you have been here <laughs> 10 days, 10 days. Yep, you so ten, 10 days without food. Very strong. <laughs> okay, go back. We come, we come. I know, I know, I understand. We, we come, okay, we come. And basically, uh, they only spent about 35 minutes in there, but they were kind of nervous. That's why they're having them go back, that they didn't want them to, to rush them. Uh, and, and they had a candy bar in their pocket, but they said that they decided not to give it to them because th they thought that that would have been a lot worse for the 12 of them and their coach to try to have one or two candy bars between all of them. So they just ended up um, just giving them an extra flashlight that each one of them had. And they said, hey, we're, we're promised we're coming back. Um, you know, and the kids were like, well, we want to leave now. It's like, well, we can't take you now. Uh, and, then, and then they came out that night. So I immediately get uh, the information. We were kind of doing 24-hour ops, so I had just finished my day shift, got recalled around 11 o'clock at night, came back. And, of course, there was like everybody was celebrating, right? Um, the, the news got out real quick. Uh, we, we said, hey, we don't recommend you release this video. And uh, it was on Facebook like 20 minutes later. And because I guess what that was doing was that was putting tremendous pressure. Like just because you found these kids, like they were still so far back and, and there, was, there was no real way that we had thought about getting them out yet. But the world knew and all of a sudden it was like there was celebrations and I remember sitting with, with Rick and John um, that night and they had like a real kind of stern look on their face, almost a depressed look. And uh, he goes, man, we just like, like this is great. He's like, but like, we just opened Pandora's box, like there's no way we're gonna, those kids are, are gonna get out, you know, they're gonna die in there. Uh, I don't think we can get them out. And I just remember thinking to myself, well, like before, you know, we say never, let's, let's just stop, you know, let's, let's let the emotions die down and let's approach this from a very factual and logical standpoint, like we do any real difficult problem. And that's what we did. We just busted out the whiteboards and I said, okay, in a perfect world with any of the resources that you, that you could have, who else would you want here? I said, you know, other cave divers. There was only two of them at the time. 
and we had been diving, but we don't have the technical capabilities to go really, really far into the cave like they do. They have side mount kits. Everything is tailored very different in a cave diving setup, and a lot of it's like kind of janky. It's like almost homemade the way that some of their kits were set up, and uh, we don't have that ability, you know, but th they do that for those exact reasons because th they go into caves and do exploration, and a lot of the time, uh, th that environment is very difficult, so their, their kit's tailored to that. And they literally counted, like, on one hand, the amount of people in the world that they trusted that they could come and help us, and it was, like, five. So they called in, uh, or they asked for permission, you know, and, and they said, yeah, yeah, we need these five guys, and then uh, we need two Australian, uh, a team of Australian guys. Uh, his name is Dr. Richard Harris, you know, and he's an anesthesiologist uh, and also a very good cave diver, one of the only in the world I know that probably does both of those. Um, and so I went down to the, the Thai general. I said, sir, we need these five, and we need these two from Australia, and they've got to be on a plane tonight or as, as soon as possible if they can. They've already been in communication with them. And it was like, you know, through, like through, uh, through the embassies it happened, and the, it was incredible. They, they ended up getting them all kind of contacted. They all volunteered to come. And, uh, and within 24 to 48 hours, I'm pretty sure all of them were on site. As they were doing that, uh, me and, and some of the other guys were basically trying to dissect this problem and, and get all the known information out of the table, right? Because something like this, like they had done other cave rescues in the past, but it's always been in like recreational caves where you have visibility. It's been other cave divers that they've had to rescue, so people that are confident in the water. But there was so many uh, what-ifs to this mission because, one, this cave is not really a diveable cave. Two, th the kids could barely swim you know, how are they going to dive? And then um, three, like, it, it was such a long way in zero visibility that, that they just didn't think it was, it was going to be feasible. So as we kind of started to dissect piece by piece and just basically break everything down, uh, we got to really see, like, the, the logistical nightmare of, like, how many tanks we were going to need. So we had to have, like, 300 additional tanks flown up from Bangkok. All these dive shops were, were sending tanks up. We had to have additional compressors. Just the vast amount of forward staging that we had to do in the cave was absolutely incredible. The locations of how we had to mark stuff, so you know you can't see, so we were having to use chem lights. So if a tank was spent, we would put a, a red chem light on it. If a tank wasn't, we'd have a green one. If it was on the right side of the cave as you were going in, you know you knew that if that was the tank you grabbed, it was going to be full. If you had to bring an empty one out, it was going to be on the left side. Like all these little things that you wouldn't think of just dirt diving to the most minute details to try to come up with like a plan that might work. Um, so yeah, here's, here's just some pictures of us basically coming up with plans and briefing them. And uh, as we were kind of the, the joint, you know, when I say joint, it was, it was kind of multiple lines of effort. The Thai SEALs and some of uh, their counterparts were, were coming up with kind of courses of action that they thought might work. And then we were also uh, parallel planning with them so it was good instead of having you know everybody just focused on one plan we had everybody working on plans that that we might thought uh, would logistically work and then when we would kind of get together and we would shoot holes in each other's plans and then you know you'd be like oh yeah you, you guys talked about this but like you didn't think about this and they'd be like oh yeah we didn't and they would do the same to us and so it was really good and you know when he was talking earlier about being just humble and respectful credibility was everything you know and it got to the point where, like, the, the ties were, were, were so trusting and, and, you know, understanding that, like, we had basically been, you know, wor working 18-hour days alongside them. And, w and we developed such a relationship that, like, towards the very end, you know, Derek Anderson was brief briefing their Minister of Interior and the Royal Guard that basically, I think, it wasn't 100%, but I'm pretty sure he called the king that night to get approval. Uh, so, like, you can imagine that was the level of, of people that we were having to brief to get approval to, to do this. So, the, the one thing we did know was that they were starving and super malnourished, so we had to get food in. Um, that, that was a no-brainer, so we, we packed up about 100 MREs, all the ones that we had in our alert. And MREs are great, because, I mean, they don't taste great, but I'll tell you what, for, for having a waterproof, super compact thing, that you can swim underwater, just keep that in the back of your head, you know, and the, the shelf life's like years. So, so even though they taste horrible, this was like the, you know, the, the lifesaver for getting 100 of these meals into these kids 
because I don't think there would have been other types of food that, that would have had so many calories and to be able to help sustain them in there and to be able to, to have them so compact because they had to go in these little tubes that the, the divers had to pull behind them like a tank. So we brought in 100 of those. We also brought in some water pumps so they could start drinking water and filtering uh, the cave water. They had initially just been sucking off the drip off water from the stalactites and that's what kept them alive was that small amount of water, the rainwater that was running off the ceiling. That's what they were drinking every day. Um, but uh, some extra flashlights and batteries and then the, the MREs and the, uh, the water pumps was like crucial. So that happened within two days. <coughs> also, like I said, the plan to bring in additional tanks in the forward stadium um, was, was kind of our phase, we called it phase zero, which was getting everything kind of pre-positioned in the cave. And so we had about 100 plus people, uh, divers included, that over the course of about 24 hours helped get a lot of those tanks into key parts of the cave where we were gonna need them. Here you can kind of see just, just the, the terrain and how difficult it was like on the right there, that, that's literally what you're diving into. And once you're in that, it's zero visibility until you come out of it. Uh, and sometimes when you do come out of it, you're coming out of it at like a head, a head height of air and that's it. You're just kind of on your back trying to save air in your tanks. So, you know, you don't breathe compressed air when you don't need to. Um, and then like to even get to where you could start diving, like I said, it was a, it was a, a good 30 minute hike in through, through uh, pretty treacherous terrain. Let's see here, all right, I'll speed up a little bit. So Thursday, the 5th of July, uh, we got the meals in and something else that we carry are these confined space air monitors. And uh, we brought three 